everybody, welcome back to Great Northwest Weaponry. This is Thomas, and today we're doing another knife demo. Just picked this up from my friends at the Warfront last weekend. This is a US model 1917 trench knife. I've wanted a trench knife in my collection for quite some time. Once upon a time, I had a model 1918, and we may look at that as the next knife that we take a look at because I actually sold it to a friend. And, uh, so yeah, I'd, I'd kind of like to do a lineage of the American fighting knife set of videos, as I also happen to have a World War II U.S. Marine Corps K-Bar, but today we're taking a look at the 1917, and we're primarily going to be talking about the model scene here with the pyramid spikes, as there are more than one version of these knives. This particular example is an LF and C. We'll go over what that means a little bit more when we get to the tabletop. But just a quick general history overview, as it was uh, apparent that the U.S. would be getting involved in World War I in 1917, and we did in fact go overseas in 1917, a commission of civil and military industrialists was tasked with creating a fighting knife that was both long enough to punch through the many layers of clothing that were often worn on the Western Front. You'd have, you know, coat, tunic, uh, depending on where you're attacking from, you might be strapped. So they wanted something with a fairly long um, stabbing implement, as well as some sort of an implement to damage the face, head, and temples. What wound up being selected was the Model 1917, originally designed by Henry Diston and Sons Company. Um, these would be indicated by a marking of H, D, and S. Again, this one is an L, F, and C. There are a few different manufacturers of these, the pyramid knuckle examples, such as this one, of which, by the way, this is the first trench knife officially adopted by the U.S., there's about three companies that made the pyramid knuckle examples as seen here. There is another style that uh, I've heard them called the dragon's teeth, where along the edges here they have these uh, five die cut teeth sticking out along both sides. And I would love to get one of those in my collection as well, probably go over the production of those a little more if we ever do that. Blade on this is about nine inches long, and it has no edges. It is just a pyramid spike. It is a very mean weapon, uh, going back to the damaging the face, head, and temples. That is the purpose for the brass knuckle guard on these, or, you know, brass knuckles is a loose term. In this case, it's actually made of iron, but the knuckle guard on these is specifically intended to bash somebody with of which is just just plain rude this is one of i would say honestly the like meanest weapons of world war one the original hd and s design was based on french trench knives that were in use at the time and uh, a lot of these would be kind of a improvised weapon the french did have the uh I believe it was a model 1916 fighting knife, the Avenger of 1871. We took a look at that a while back. It'll be in the uh, the knives playlist along with this video when it is completed. These wouldn't stick around for very long and exact production numbers are unknown. We'll go into the production of Elephant Sea, particularly when we go to the tabletop here in a moment. The last half of the video probably will be tabletop, but exact production is unknown. Production ceased in 1918, where they were phased out for a 1918 model, of which I've also heard called a Mark I. Again, I'd like to take a look at one of those down the road, as I do have potential access to one. A friend of mine has the one that was, once upon a time, mine. But these, uh, a lot of the reason that they wanted these replaced was largely, first off, again, you got a 9-inch spike, no edge, and they had a tendency to break. I've seen a lot of these, actually, that are busted a couple inches or about halfway down. I've even seen ones that were broken all the way down at the uh, at the guard here. But this one is, uh, in spite of being very rusty on the, uh, on the guard, is in complete condition. The blade was originally blued. You can see original bluing largely intact there, somewhat up here and kind of sparse on, on this side here. 
but the blade would, or, you know, the blade, is the spike was originally blued. Uh, before we go to the tabletop here, I just gotta say, going back to my statement that this is one of the meanest weapons of World War One, in my opinion, this is, like, if I were to pick any weapon to not be attacked with physically, I'm talking one-on-one, -on -one, I'm, I'm not counting, like, bombs, but if I was in a fight with somebody, this is rude. This this is just mean. You know, give some, some a sock a sock on the jaw with some sort of a knuckle knife like this, and you're talking shredded flesh, broken bones, and this spike is going to leave a near unstitchable wound, as it is just you know you're gonna pierce in and then just rip all the way to the base. It was designed with ill intentions, and being an implement of war, that is not shocking, but. There is a, a claim that is not entirely accurate that these were banned by the Geneva Convention. They could be considered to fall under weapons designed to cause unnecessary suffering, as, again, a, a wound from this is just nasty, and a, a stab from, um, from this spike would leave a wound that would be very difficult to patch, as it is going to rip open a hole rather than a slice or a, a piercing wound as uh, what would be left by a jacketed bullet, this is going to rip open a pretty substantial wound that even if the person survives, it is very possible that it will the wound will still turn septic and kill them later on. It is a mean implement, and then again, you, you know, go back to the knuckles is just, just plain rude. <laughs> anyway... We're going to go ahead and finish up this video looking from the tabletop perspective and try and look at the marking on this. Again, the, uh, the handguard is somewhat corroded, but the marking is visible and uh, some kind of finishing facts. From this perspective, we can definitely see better what I was mentioning about the bluing of the blade and the condition of it on this. A lot of the bluing is missing on this side, and on this side it is very nearly non-existent on the inside much more of it remaining a little bit missing when you get closer to the tip unfortunately i do not have a sheath for this but i did get a pretty good deal on it now for the marking there is really only one and it is what is seen at the tip of my finger right there this is us lfnc 1917 now there are three different manufacturers of the examples with the pyramid spikes as seen on this. And here we can get a better look at these pyramid spikes. But the three different manufacturers. Again, the example seen here is an LFNC. This is short for Landers, Frary, and Clark. Approximately 113,000 were made by this company, and a number of the different companies making different variations of these knives, numbers are not available. LFNC is one of the exceptions to this. The other two examples are the original designer, Henry Diston and Sons, or HD&S, as well as Oneida Community Limited, or OCL. These will all be marked in the same spot seen on this example right there. Examples of the Dragon's Teeth models were made all the way up until 1918. The original manufacturer actually switched to the Dragon's Teeth model in 1918, but then only a, a couple, like, that model replaced this model and was then replaced by the true U.S. Model 1918 Mark I trench knife, the actual brass knuckle knife, of which, if all goes well, will be the next knife demo that we do. So, that is it. U.S. Model 1917 trench knife, the first... American Trench Knife officially issued for service. Hope you all enjoyed the video. It's been Thomas with Great Northwest Weaponry, and I will see you next time.